One of the most important things that you need to know before you carry a weapon in self-defense is whether or not you are in a place that requires a duty to retreat. And here in Wisconsin, we kind of do, kind of don't. Today, we're gonna to be walking through a lesson in how a Wisconsin Supreme Court decision got undone across 50 years of concerted efforts to undo it. This is gonna be a little interesting and you're gonna learn a lot. So this is not only relevant to the Wisconsin folks, this is gonna be relevant to everyone else because you could be the next Wisconsin. Let's get into it. So if you go back to the 1800s, many different states actually had a statutory duty to retreat. In other words, the state legislature passed a bill signed into law by the governor saying that before you can use deadly force, you must exhaust your options to retreat. Then and only then can you use deadly force. By the way, there's a fantastic video that we've got coming out. I've been reading a book and all sorts of different papers about duty to retreat laws across the country and their history. So be sure to subscribe to make sure that you don't miss that. It's coming out soon. Some states that did not have an emphatic duty to retreat written into law nonetheless had judges give jury instructions at the end of self-defense jury cases where they advised the jury on the fact that, look, you can decide whether or not this person exhausted all of their retreat options before they use self-defense. And if they failed to exhaust all their retreat options before they use self-defense, then they cannot use deadly force in self-defense. That's called jury instructions. It's when a judge gives the, well, instructions to the jury, known as jury instructions, on how they are to understand and interpret the law, and then they are the ones to decide the facts. That is how jury trials work. Juries decide facts, judges decide law, and they advise them through jury instructions on what that is. Wisconsin was one of those states that throughout the late 1800s to early 1900s saw a wave of state Supreme Courts as well as territorial Supreme Courts basically strike down duties to retreat and say, nope, abrogated, done. And Wisconsin had the very same thing happen in 1909 from a Marinette case called State v. Miller. The facts of the case really aren't all that important. Just very briefly, there was basically a house scuffle. Someone wound up leaving uh, the house and then they wanted to come back in. And Miller was standing at the doorway and basically wouldn't let him back in and shot the guy with the rifle. While the state Supreme Court declined to overturn the conviction, they did take the opportunity to say the following, quote, the ancient doctrine requiring the party assaulted to retreat to the wall may have been all right in the days of chivalry, so-called, But by almost common consent of the molders of the unwritten law, in later years it is unadaptable to our modern development and therefore has been pretty generally and in this state very definitely abandoned. It has been superseded by a doctrine in harmony with the divine right of self-defense. The doctrine that when one is where he has a right to be and does not create the danger by his own wrongful conduct, he may stand his ground." End quote. Now, it's important that what the Wisconsin Supreme Court did do here is really two things. Number one, they said duty to retreat, gone. And they even used the words, may stand your ground. The second thing that they did, though, is they did acknowledge the fact that you may not always stand your ground. Sometimes you do have a duty to retreat. That gets us to the topic of provocation, which is still alive and well in Wisconsin's newly adopted revised penal code from the mid-1950s, which went into effect in 1956. You can still find that Wisconsin Statute 939.48, sub to sub A. If you provoke an attack in Wisconsin, as in virtually every other state that I'm familiar with, you may not use self-defense. So the quintessential example that I like to use to explain this is if I walk into a liquor store and I go to rob it with a knife and the cashier, after hearing my demand and I'm presenting my knife, he correctly summarizes that I could be a deadly threat. He pulls out a firearm in self-defense. And as he does that, I cannot go, oh, this guy might shoot me. I can use self-defense and I'm going to stab him first. No, because I provoked his use of deadly force, his lawful use of deadly force. However, I can still regain my right to self-defense if I retreat. Yes, this can lead to some sometimes absolutely despicable outcomes whereby the bad guy with who's been in and out of jail and prison his whole life may wind up actually shooting the innocent family man who didn't understand the law and just got overzealous in following them out. But again, this is why you need to know the laws if you're gonna be messing around with any kind of deadly weapons. By the way, something like this exact same thing happened in real life. I recently did a video on it. That's linked in the description box below where the good guy lost his life and the bad guy got away with it, okay? So if you're curious, check that out. But understand that there is the 
element of provocation that the Wisconsin Supreme Court left as an open lane that you cannot stand your ground in those situations. And that's going to be important in a moment. Right now, we're building all the different ingredients to explain this. Okay. So I mentioned before that Wisconsin, we updated, like many other states, our criminal code in the 1950s. And the way that this works is generally some think tanks or different states will maybe write up a whole code of whatever it is that they're talking about, employment law, landlord, tenant, whatever it might be. And many other states will basically copy, paste, or they'll cover and sample different portions of it. Now, sometimes when legislatures, when they write bills and then they eventually get turned into law, they'll sometimes tell you a little bit about what their reasoning or what their thinking is. These are sometimes called legislative notes or draft notes, or they call them different things in different places, but it goes to the legislative intent of what was trying to happen by accomplishing the new particular law. We have an interesting 1953 draft note which really is the source of all the problems here in Wisconsin. Now, let's introduce what these problems are. The problem is this, is that if you are ever in a self-defense jury trial in Wisconsin, there's a really good chance that you're going to be facing Wisconsin Criminal Jury Instruction 810, linked in the description below. I'm going to read it here. It's brief. I want you to imagine that you just went through the closing arguments in your self-defense jury trial. The judge is advising the jury on, here's the law that you need to understand when you decide this case. This is what you're going to hear the judge tell your jury. Quote, there is no duty to retreat. However, in determining whether the defendant reasonably believed the amount of force used was necessary to prevent or terminate the interference, you may consider whether the defendant had the opportunity to retreat with safety, whether such retreat was feasible, and whether the defendant knew of the opportunity to retreat, end quote. They start with the words, there is no duty to retreat. That's, of course, a tacit acknowledgement of State v. Miller, the 1909 case where the Wisconsin Supreme Court said emphatically, no duty to retreat. All right. But then they go on to basically create a duty to retreat, Okay. Because after all, they say, well, look, there's no duty to retreat. But basically, if they could have retreated with safety and if it was feasible and if they knew about it, then in essence, they should have retreated because therefore the use of deadly force was unreasonable, which makes it illegal, which then turns it into a homicide or whatever it is that you're talking about. Doesn't that kind of feel like we suddenly have a duty to retreat? Doesn't that kind of feel like that very first sentence, there is no duty to retreat. But by the way, if the defendant cannot check these three boxes, then look, you now have a duty to retreat. Because that's what it sounds like to me. And that's what it is, I believe, intended to sound and feel like to juries. But again, we absolutely don't have a duty to retreat. So how did we get here? Well, as I mentioned before, there was a 1953 legislative draft note when it came to the 1956 revised criminal code. And the draft note said this, under this section, the feasibility of retreat from the assailant with one exception is handled as an aspect of the question of whether the actor reasonably believed the force used was necessary to prevent or terminate the interference. The exception is the case where the actor himself provoked the attack. And then they go on to talk about basically if you provoke an attack, you have to retreat to regain your right to deadly force. That's fine. The bottom line is this. The Wisconsin Supreme Court said that we have no duty to retreat. And then some, not even a necessarily a, uh, a state representative or a senator, we just have a legislative draft note where somebody said, oh, by the way, and this is how you ought to do things. That is not law. That is a draft note. So how the heck do we still have jury instruction 810 here? If you actually go to jury instruction 810, and if you read through the footnotes, and by the way, this goes to how all these things can be overwhelmed and how the exceptions can overwhelm the rules, so to speak, because the rule is that we have no duty to retreat. But if you're a juror sitting in a self-defense case, you're going to absolutely feel like we may have a duty to retreat because you've read or have had read to you jury instruction 810. So here's the explanation coming from the jury instruction committee, which is largely comprised of, of judges, both present and retired. So towards the bottom of jury instruction 810, you're going to see the claimed legal authority for why this is lawful. Now, I will note that jury instruction 810 was passed in 1966 as part of the jury instruction committee and jury instruction committees, which are the committees that in Wisconsin, as I'm sure in many other states, it's largely comprised of current and oftentimes retired judges who often they add their input on what the jury instructions should read, and they grapple with new emerging issues in the law and so forth to basically revise and keep things up to date. Here we run into this issue. 
The jury instruction is basically self-authenticating largely. What do I mean? I mean, it's claiming its legal authority comes down to the fact that, well, look, it's been in, around since 1966 and nobody seems to have an issue with it. And by the way, there's this case that came out in 1999 called State v. Wagner, which basically said that, hey, look, it's okay. All right, well, I don't know about the first one that it's it must be legal because it's been around forever because there's been a lot of awful things justified under those grounds. But let's take a look at the second ground, which is the State v. Wagner case. Now, if you actually go to that case, State v. Wagner does deal with this lightly, but they basically claim the legal authority for 810 actually comes from a different case called State v. Herridges, H-E-R-R-I-G-E-S, specifically from page 303. So that's now going to be the place where we find the legal authority for this new duty to retreat that we have, right? So if you go to page 303 of that particular case, you find out that they're not actually talking about jury instruction 810 at all. They're actually talking about jury instruction 815. Don't get lost on this. 815 is the jury instruction that says that if you provoke an attack, you now have a duty to retreat. Right. Was the Safety Wagner court just confused about what was going on here and confused the fact that if you provoke an attack as in jury instruction 815, now you have a duty to retreat, that that is not the same as 810, which just basically creates a duty to retreat, even though they say that they don't? You know, that old expression that don't trust anything that comes before the word but. You may as well put a but in jury instruction 810 where it says there is no duty to retreat, but if you cannot check these boxes, you now have a duty to retreat because your use of force was unreasonable. And so brings us to the current situation that we have in Wisconsin, where there is absolutely no duty to retreat unless you have an opportunity to retreat, then you have a duty to retreat. This is insane. And unfortunately, I don't see it with our current deadlock as far as what's been going on with Wisconsin politics, which I don't really get into. I don't see this resolving itself. But for those of you outside Wisconsin, this is an important lesson in the fact of how small technical things can happen with jury instructions that maybe you're unaware of, which seemingly outright contradict what the law says. They can seemingly contradict not only what the statutes have said, but also, of course, what your state Supreme Court has said, and then how people can basically cut and chip away at it over decades to the point where, yeah, we don't have a duty to retreat. Unless you can retreat, then you have a duty to retreat. So guys, you know I don't normally go into the weeds when we start talking about individual states and in particular cases, but this one really is an exception because, again, we've got this crazy situation. If you want me to go into more specific issues like this, let me know by clicking like, let me know in the comment field below, and of course sharing this video around. I take a lot of your feedback about what I should do, frankly, based off of your comments as well as the performance of the videos. If I see a video that stinks and gets no views, it tells me you guys don't really interested in it. And conversely, if I see a video do well by getting things like likes and shares, it tells me it must be doing pretty well. Also, lastly, of course, don't forget to subscribe to make sure you don't miss any new content. And as always, we will see you in the next one. Thanks for sticking around to the end of the video. If you enjoyed this one, please feel free to check out some of our other great content and we'll see you in the next one.